quickly here uh, to give a colloquium today on this uh, unusual day of the week. He'll speak on uh, mirror symmetry, pairs of pants, and cylinders. I think that yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, right. So my goal is going to be to try to explain a bit to non-specialists what mirror symmetry is about in general and where maybe, well, one possible direction among many where it's headed. Um, and so what's the general context? So mirror symmetry, depending on your perspective, it's a fact or it's a belief or it's a school of thought. Um, that says, roughly speaking, that doing symplectic geometry on some space will correspond to doing algebraic geometry or something similar to it on a different space. And so these are called mirror spaces, by definition. And what kind of spaces we have in mind is something that has been expanding through time uh, quite a bit. So this initially came out of topological string theory. And so this maybe was initially stated for, say, complex projective Calabi-Yau manifolds. So things that have trivial canonical bundle. So they're just complicated enough, but not too much. And for physicists, this was relevant because there's extra supersymmetry in the theory that makes all sorts of magic happen. Uh, they were especially interested in complex dimension three because that's a magical dimension for string theory. I think mathematicians realized pretty quickly that dimension three was not particularly crucial to that. Uh, but what's been realized over time is in fact that by now there's a much more general setting. Um, but if you're willing to relax a bit the notion of space. Okay. And so we're going to see that um, along the way. And so the settings in which we now think mirror symmetry holds are actually very, you know, very vast. Um, and so the current perspective, the current goal, I would say, you know, what's a realistic level of generality to work in, would be something like, um, well, a level of generality that includes non-compact, non-smooth, non-Calabiao spaces. So basically, you want to get rid of all the possible assumptions. Uh, we're not yet there. You might actually want to even remove the assumption that this is a commutative space in the usual sense and various other things. Um, but so the kind of setting I want to look at to illustrate a little bit. So I, I'm not going to worry about non-smooth because I'm, well, actually, we're going to see it happen as well. So I can leave it. Um, anyway, so the current goal of you know, more modestly work that I'm doing with Mohamed Abu Zaid these days is to understand the case of, say, X is a smooth complete intersection in a toric variety, not necessarily compact, so including the base case of say, C star to the N for me is a perfectly fine toric variety. Um, and their mirrors, which are not quite the same class of spaces, but I don't want to start scaring you right away. Um, so the two examples that I want to use, therefore, it used to be that you, know, you couldn't talk about mirror symmetry without starting with first example. Well, the simplest example of a compact Calabi-Yau is the elliptic curve. And then people would immediately have to go up in dimension and talk about k-free surfaces, and then the quintic freefold, the quintic hypersurface in CP4. And by now, we understand, essentially, homological mirror symmetry 
which is the, yeah, I haven't told you yet what that is. But anyway, mirror symmetry is well understood in this sort of setting. And homological mirror symmetry, uh, in this case, is anyway, the elliptic curve started with, I would say, Polish Chuk and Zaslow. K free surfaces, I would put Seidel's name probably, and quintic freefold, Nick Sheridan. Okay, so I haven't told you yet what homological mirror symmetry is, so you don't know yet what it is these people have proved. Um, but in this vaster world where you want to allow things that are not Calabio, not compact, and so on, then the base, you know, there's much, much simpler building blocks than this. So, the building blocks that I want to use today are in fact going to be very, very simple. The cylinder is actually the simplest Calabio. It has the, sorry, the simplest Calabio of all is actually the point. But I think it would be slightly confusing to try to talk about mirror symmetry for the point. Um, and then I think the cylinder is the next simplest example. And then to give you a sense of what might happen when you go away from the Calabia world, I will try to explain a little bit about the pair of pants, which has the advantage of being a natural building block for bigger Riemann surfaces. Um, and I will completely let you imagine what might happen in higher dimensions, some of the extensions to higher dimensions, some of it is straightforward, some of it is hard, some of it is unknown. Uh, but at least I'm hoping you will see a little bit of a picture. Okay, so what do we mean by mirror symmetry? If you ask different people, they will probably have different answers. Um, and so what I want to focus on is what's known as homological mirror symmetry which is something introduced by Konsevich in 1994 for Calabios and then extended by him and by others outside of that setting. So what does homological mirror symmetry say? It says when you have a mirror pair as in, well, it's given to you by physicists who say this space is mirror to that space or you somehow think they should be mirror or you find one, Anyway, so a good test for knowing that you have a pair of mirror spaces is that on the symplectic side, you want to look at Lagrangian submanifolds. Flex should correspond to coherent sheaves on X check on the mirror. So what is a Lagrangian submanifold? Well, if you know your symplectic geometry, a symplectic manifold carries a real symplectic two-form. Locally, it looks like some dxi dyi. And then a Lagrangian submanifold is something of half a dimension on which the symplectic form vanishes. Think of something like Rn inside Cn. Because my examples will be one-dimensional, my life is a lot easier. A Lagrangian submanifold on a surface is just you know, a one-dimensional submanifold. OK. Um, so what you see immediately is that Lagrangian submanifolds can be intersected with each other. They want to intersect in just isolated points. And you can ask how stable are Lagrangian intersections under isotopies? So in dimension one, this looks like a very topological problem. And in some sense, you can reduce it to that. In higher dimension, symplectic geometry really kicks in and gives you more rigidity phenomena. But the answers can be understood in the same way. So in particular, the kinds of isotopies we want to allow should preserve the condition of being Lagrangian in dimension one that will be automatic. But they also have an extra property. So they're called Hamiltonian isotopies, which means when you wiggle, the amount of area swept by your Lagrangian needs to be zero. So if you put this condition, then you have an extra rigidity that happens. Say, think, for example, of just a curve that runs around a cylinder. Of course, you can move it by isotopies away from itself. But if you insist on sweeping no area, then it will have to stay on itself. You, you will have at least two intersection points. Okay? So now we have something to calculate how much Lagrangians need to intersect in this sense. And that is called Lagrangian Fleur homology, 
which is something that measures intersections of Lagrangians. Okay, so it's the homology of a complex called the Fleur complex for a pair of Lagrangians, which is just a vector space generated by intersection points. if they intersect transversely. If they don't, well, wiggle one of them a little bit so that they intersect transversely. Okay? Then there's a differential which counts configurations like these. So if you have L0, L1, an intersection point P and intersection point Q, you will declare that boundary of P equals T to be, let's say that the area of this thing is A. Okay, the little remnant of symplectic geometry in dimension one that we have is we have an area form. So we have a notion of area of regions like that. We have a formal variable T. And we put T to the A, the amount of area, times Q, this intersection point. Okay? And then, of course, if you have many such configurations, you count all of them. That defines a differential. Uh, it's a fact that D squared is zero. And in this setting, in more complicated settings, this is the subject of a lot of study. You can look at the almost 1,000 pages that Kenji Fukaya and co-authors have written on the subject. And what is also interesting is there is a multiplicative structure on these Fleur homologies. Okay, and what that does is it counts configurations that look like that. If you have L0, L1, and L2, then you'll say that P times Q equals, anyway, there's some coefficient that, again, measures the area of this disk times R. Okay. This is kind of simplified. There are also signs and lots of things that need to be put in there. So what this gets you to, when you do it more carefully, is something called the Fukaya category. Whose objects are Lagrangian submanifolds, so Fouquet category of a symplectic manifold, whose objects are Lagrangian submanifolds, plus extra data needed to make sense of the whole theory, and morphisms are Fleur complexes, and composition is the Fleur product. X might not be so right now, X. Uh, sorry. So right now, this is for compact Lagrangians. I will explain in a moment what we do with non-compact Lagrangians. You're right. Uh, the way I've stated it right now, Lagrangians look compact. When they, later on, very soon, I will allow them to be non-compact, and we'll need to describe what we do at infinity. The yeah, the classical version is for compact things. Okay. So. Why do we care about this? Well, this is really interesting for a lot of reasons in symplectic geometry. It allows us to understand what Lagrangian submanifolds exist in a symplectic manifold, how they intersect, and so on. Um, but also importantly, this enters into this formulation of mirror symmetry. So Konsevich's conjecture is when you have a mirror pair, you have an equivalence, or well, let's say a derived equivalence, between the Foucault category of X and coherent sheaves on the mirror. Ah, sorry, before I leave it at that. So what's up here is very simplified. In particular, the Fouquet category is actually what's called an A-infinity category, which means that the composition is associative only up to homotopy. So there's actually a nice associative product on cohomology, but at chain level, you have a lot of homotopy data and things that need to be taken into account. Anyway, that's for the experts, I think, for... 
if you've never seen a Lagrangian submanifold, then you shouldn't worry too much about this. Okay. So homological mirror symmetry says that the derived Fouquet category of X should be equivalent to the derived category of coherent sheaves on the mirror space. Remember, a coherent sheaf is, well, it's what it is, but if you are a differential geometer and completely lost with sheaves, a nice convenient approximation is think of a complex submanifold and a holomorphic vector bundle over it. Okay, and that's close enough for our purposes. Um, so, if you forget about the derived thing, saying that these categories are equivalent would tell you that you have a way to correspond Lagrangian submanifold and a coherent sheaf on X check. And in such a way that morphism spaces and compositions match. So, what does that mean? Um, the Fleur cohomology of L0, L1, or you can say L I, L J, whatever, any two of them, should be isomorphic to what's called the X groups of these sheaves. Um, so X0 is just morphisms of sheaves. It's Anyway, maybe what's simplest to think about is if you have things that are actually vector bundles over um, some sub-varieties, then what you want to do is you want to do simultaneously intersection theory for the sub-varieties and study sections of uh, homes of the vector bundles. And then you want to take the cohomology of that. Um, okay, so anyway, so you expect a correspondence between these things. And of course, how exactly it works and you know, compositions, so products on these things should match. So you know, when you first see that, you think, well, that's kind of strange, or you know, why do I care about this or something? And one possible reason for why we care is that this has predictive power on both sides, but especially on the symplectic side, because usually, well, algebraic geometry is a much more venerable field with you know, much, much more robust understanding of what's happening. The list of open questions in symplectic geometry starts with very embarrassing things. For example, can we classify Lagrangian submanifolds in R2N? Uh, this does not help to answer it, unfortunately. But. In R4, there is. Uh, there was a preprint recently that uh, tried to show the classification of Lagrangian tori in R4 up to Hamilton isotopy. Uh, so there is a conjecture which says they're all either product tori or there's another class called Chekhanov tori. Uh, I think the status of the preprint is unclear. <laughs> in R6, we have no idea in that there's infinitely many families of examples and we don't know what's the general recipe. This is only useful if you can identify what the mirror of space is. Yes, uh, but also separately, this is really good at understanding the intersection properties of Lagrangians, but not necessarily quite so much their geometry. So two Lagrangians whose, whose intersection properties with anything else are the same are kind of indistinguishable. They're isomorphic usually as objects of the Fouquet category. You know, if you can't test the difference between two Lagrangians by pairing that with something else, then you're not going to get very far in here. Um, so classical topological questions are not always easy to answer in this language. Anyway, maybe I shouldn't have tried to motivate. Anyway, so instead let's try to understand a little bit what happens concretely on some simple examples. Okay. So the example I want to think about for now is the cylinder. So you can think of that as R times S1, or C star, depending on your persuasion. Um, and the mirror of that is actually also a cylinder, or C star. Okay. And so we might ask, well, how does mirror symmetry here work? So 
you know, first thing you might try to do is understand what are your favorite Lagrangians here. And you know, if I'm telling you, you know, check homological mirror symmetry for these, you'll say, well, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to look at some Lagrangians, look at some sheaves, and match them. Okay? And of course, you, you want to do that with, you know, some sort of scheme in mind. But anyway, let's just start this way. So if I just take a circle, these are the main things I can think of doing as Lagrangians in here. Um, then I can calculate what happens if I take, so let's call this guy S for circle. Um, that's actually terrible. Let's call it F. Okay, so I can try to calculate the Fleur cohomology of F with itself. So to do that, I would probably first perturb a little bit. And as I mentioned before, I can only wiggle while sweeping no area. So the simplest thing I can do is this. And then I will find that my complex has two generators, P and Q. Ah, but there's two of these disks connecting them. I will often say holomorphic disks because in higher dimensions, I didn't tell you, but in higher dimensions, you're supposed to look for holomorphic disks with boundaries in the Lagrangians. That's what you count. Um, and so these two disks contribute to tell me, well, they actually say that the boundary of P will be, so there's an amount of area A and the same amount of area A, and there's this coefficient T to the A minus T to the A times Q, so which is zero, which means the Fleur differential is zero. And this is going to be generated by this guy's P and Q. And you can calculate the ring structure, and you will find that actually, so for that, you take a third copy and you look for triangles. And if you do the exercise, you'll see that this just matches with the cohomology of a circle. In fact, you can ask a symplectic geometer, and they will tell you, yes, for a compact Lagrangian that doesn't bound any disks, you expect the Fleur cohomology with itself to match with its usual classical cohomology. And secretly, what this is about is an instance of a reduction of Lagrangian Fleur theory to Morse theory. You should think of P and Q as max and min of a Morse function on your circle, and you're doing the Morse homology. OK, so all right. Now, if you want something more interesting, take a different such circle, and then you find they don't intersect. So any such circle has Fleur homology, cohomology of S1, uh, but no two of them talk to each other. So by different, I mean they're not in the same place. And see, even if you wiggle them so that they talk to each other, then you'll see again two intersections, but the amounts of area will be different. And so you will not have such a cancellation between the two contributions to the differential, and then the homology will die. OK, so how can we reproduce that in algebraic geometry? Well, you know, the answer is going to look like it comes out of nowhere, because there's just not enough data here, actually. But if I take a point in a curve, in this case, C star, and I ask about its skyscraper sheaf, OK? So that just means you, know, you have a single fiber of rank 1 at that point and nothing anywhere else. So certainly, different skyscraper sheaves don't talk to each other. And if you try to calculate what happens with one of these sheaves with itself, there you need to ask an algebraic geometer unless you're one, because uh, basically this is you know not so e well. This is not so hard if you know what you're doing, but you know this is not something I can explain without the background. Uh, what you need to do is you need actually to replace one of these by a projective resolution, which means you think of, oh, remember that this guy P had a defining equation, which might be, you know, called Z the coordinate. Uh, that might be, the equation might be Z equals some value Z zero. And then that means that the map from the trivial line bundle to itself, given by multiplication by Z minus Z zero, will be injective and will have co-kernel exactly this. And now uh, such resolutions are how you compute basically sheaf cohomology. And using this, you will find 
but this has not only a morphism, namely, you know, you can map this fiber to itself by multiplication by some scalar. So there's a copy of C in degree zero. But there's also a non-trivial extension class in degree one. And the ring structure is also that of a cohomology of a circle. Okay. So now you find that, well, these things are possibly willing to match up, except you would need to understand in what sense the collection of all these circles corresponds to the collection of all these points. Okay. And with what I've told you, the answer should be obviously they don't. Because there's a real one-parameter family of these, there's a complex one-parameter family of those. Uh, the answer to that is there's extra data here in the form of local systems that correct for the difference. Okay, but you can't get very far in algebraic geometry if you only have points. So you know what's missing, right? What's missing is the structure sheaf, or if you want the trivial vector bundle. That one is much more interesting because it talks to all the points and it has interesting endomorphisms, namely all the functions on this space. So that's what we need to put there. So now we might want to think about the structure sheaf, O, structure sheaf, also known as trivial vector bundle, if you prefer. And this one has, well, there's no higher extension, so we'll just write HOM, O, O. It's just the ring of global functions. Okay? So now you can ask, well, what do we mean by global functions on the C star? And if you're a uh, complex analytic geometer, I have to stop you, we're actually Mostly, well, there's a question of completions and so on, but I want to think in the algebraic sense. So I will think of Laurent polynomials in one variable. Okay, these are the functions I want to look at on C star. So the question is, what might correspond to that? Is there a Lagrangian submanifold whose self-intersections as a vector space over C is infinite dimensional with countably many generators and where the multiplicative structure is that of Laurent polynomials. So if you look for a compact Lagrangian, you have no chance, right? Because these, these will always intersect in finitely many points. So that tells you you need to look at non-compact Lagrangians. And this is where we start getting into non-classical, not quite classical mirror symmetry. So the only reasonable answer you can come up with is that you know, we need a non-compact Lagrangian, and the most reasonable non-compact Lagrangian we can think of is this one. Okay, so let's think of this guy, L0. Um, and let's ask ourselves, how can we make Fleur theory for this Lagrangian work? So a piece of good news before we go into any details is it does intersect every circle in one point, just like O, the structure sheaf, and skyscraper sheaves have a one-dimensional morphism or extension space. So, well, I'm just going to tell you what the rule is. There's something called wrapped Fleur homology, which is an extension to the non-compact setting due to Abu Zaid and Seidel. Where the rule will be that each time you want to intersect non-compact Lagrangians, you're going to push them, you're going to perturb them. You know, just as I said, in the, even in the compact case, you may want a small perturbation. Well, now you're going to want a large perturbation so that you set things at infinity to be always in a certain position. What is the position that you want to put things in? The answer is you will want to push things in the positive direction along the boundary. So what do I mean by that? In dimension one, it's easy, and I will probably leave it at that in what I'm going to write. Um, so push Lagrangians at infinity in the positive direction. And if you know the words that I'm about to say, what you do in general is you're in the class of symplectic manifolds with contact boundary, or with contact, um, 
contact boundary at infinity. So things that look like the simplectization of a contact manifold. And the contact, the contact manifold has something called the rape vector field. And what you push by is the rape flow in increasing amounts as you go out to infinity. So there's a certain Hamiltonian perturbation that does this. So concretely, what that means is, uh, do I have color somewhere? No, OK, well. So what I will do is if I want to study the morphisms of L0 with itself, I will actually push L0 around like this, infinitely you know, wrapping it around and around in the cylindrical ends. So that's why it's called wrapped Fleur homology. And now, how many times does L0 intersect itself? Well, the answer is infinitely many at regularly spaced intervals. So as a, so one usually writes W for wrapped instead of Fleur in this context. The wrapped Fleur complex of L0 with itself will be spanned by all these intersection points. Let's give them names. Let's say x0, x1, x2, and so on. And here, x minus 1, x minus 2, and so on. And so how is this going to be a ring? To make it into a ring, I need, again, to have three copies of my Lagrangian. And the perturbation rule is still there. I want to perturb so that each of them twists faster than the previous ones. So if I want to calculate the product structure on this wrapped Fleur cohomology, so I didn't tell you. Uh, the differential is zero, so you can think of complex or cohomology interchangeably. To do a product, I need to study, well, I have three copies of L0. One is the old one. One has been pushed around at a certain pace. And the other one has been pushed around. No, this is white as well. Well, too bad. Twice as fast. So, or you know, faster. Anything that's faster would be perfectly fine. So I'm losing track of them. Anyway, and now what I want to look for is a count of triangles with given corners at intersection points labeled by these xi's. So what you find is if you pick an intersection of the one that's been pushed a lot, so maybe I should give them names. So this is L0. This is like the once perturbed L0. This one is twice perturbed L0. So this is twice perturbed. This is once perturbed. This is L0. Um, so pick this intersection point between the twice perturbed and the once perturbed. Pick, say, this intersection between the once perturbed and the unperturbed. And you can ask, are there any triangles? The answer is yes. See, there is one that starts at the front and gets thinner and thinner and comes back here. And in fact, it's not hard to check that for every pair of intersection points you choose, there will be exactly one such triangle. Then you need to understand exactly what is the labeling how do I make intersections of these guys correspond to intersections of the initial guys and so on? But what you will find is at the end of the day, you'll find that xi times xj equals xi plus j. That's essentially just you know, basic geometry of triangles for all i and j in z. And so what you find is that this looks a lot like multiplication of Laurent monomials. You're just going to call x sub i. Maybe x to the i would be a better notation. And then this looks like Laurent polynomials. Okay. So then you can ask, well, how much more do we need to do? The answer is not much, because there's, a, there's an algebraic feature, which is that this Lagrangian L0 generates the wrapped Fouquet category. That means every other Lagrangian can be expressed algebraically in terms of L0. 
In particular, if you understand really well how a Lagrangian intersects with L0, then you've actually classified it as an object of a Foucault category. So what that, in some sense, basically, you can reduce to studying L0 only. So L0 generates the wrapped Fouquet category of a cylinder. This is a special case of a result due to Abu Zaid in general. And a consequence of that is I can embed the wrapped category of a cylinder into the, into the category of modules over Laurent polynomials. How do I do that? Well, if I have some Lagrangian let's call it T, any test Lagrangian, I can do the wrapped Fleur homology, well, I should do it at chain level, so the wrapped Fleur complex of L0 with T. Okay, And I can ask, what is this? So by default, it's a chain complex. It has a differential. But it's also a module over the endomorphisms of L0 because I can multiply morphism from L0 to itself with something from L0 to T, which means count triangles with sides on L0, perturbed L0, and T to get a new intersection. Um, so this module structure over this algebra tells me how to turn a Lagrangian into a module over Laurent polynomials. And that's, in fact, how mirror symmetry works, because this is coherent sheaves on the mirror. Okay. So anyway, so this there it is, a proof of homological mirror symmetry with, with a lot of shortcuts and simplifications. Okay. So then you can ask, well, how you know how much can you play with that or how deep is this? And there's various directions in which this generalizes. One direction is towards uh Calabiaos, one direction is towards Fano varieties. And for Calabiaos, just to mention quickly, if you're dealing with an elliptic curve, what you do is basically you take this picture and you close it up on itself. And then, of course, you don't do any kind of infinite twisting because you know, it's, it's compact. You don't need to go non-compact. Um, and then you have similar calculations counting triangles involved. That's essentially what Polish Chuk-Zaslow did. You find that the counts of these triangles with suitable weights look a lot like hypergeometric series. And you rediscover theta functions if you are not aware of them. Um, and that's how mirror symmetry for elliptic curves works. In Anyway, there's, there's countless possible ways to generalize that. So the one I want to go into instead is going to be the pair of pants because that sounds pretty easy as well. But in fact, that's the first example of mirror symmetry for varieties of general type. And so that tells you, you know, if you can achieve that, that will tell you that indeed, assuming that you were Calabiao or even you know simpler than Calabiao was not needed. Okay. Before that, any questions on the general things so far? No, still mostly okay. 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 So, what will happen if we try to reproduce things for the pair of pants? So before you can ask, no, the mirror of a pair of pants will not be a pair of pants. So in particular, yeah, I forgot to say. So there's, of course, two halves to mirror symmetry. I can compare the symplectic geometry of x with the algebraic geometry of the mirror, or vice versa. For the cylinder, well, I've done both at once because they're the same. So that's, you know, I don't need to worry about the other direction. For a pair of pants, there will be actually two statements. So let's anyway, let's think about the pair of pants. So the pair of pants is just a three times punctured sphere. And I might ask, what is it mirror to? So my first instinct might be, well, let's look at some compact Lagrangians, like these kinds of circles. And I will not see very much interesting, because they will still look like skyscraper sheaves of points on something. There's a really clever immersed compact Lagrangian here studied by Seidel, but I'm not going to 
how it or discuss it yet in here. Instead, well, since we just had some luck with non-compact Lagrangians, we might just continue with you know, the same general direction. So let's think again of this guy L0 in the wrapped category of a pair of pants, you know, in the hopes that maybe it will give us a clue to what is the mirror. And so we want to calculate the wrapped floor complex of L0 with itself again, in the hopes that it, tell us some, it will tell us something. Well, the answer is, you know, as before, take L0 and perturb it by pushing around, and you will see, again, a Z worth of intersections. And let's calculate the product structure on this Z worth of intersections. Well, we still have a picture here. What changes? Well, what changes is the pair of pants has an extra hole. Okay? So in particular, what it means is to calculate this, all I need to do is look back at my picture and ask which of the triangles I had found that gave me these relations still exist on the pair of pants and which ones no longer are there because of this extra puncture. Of course, I'm not allowed to go over this region. And so now you have to do a bit, you know, you go back to the labeling and so on, and you realize that the cases where your triangle passes over the central region is exactly the cases where the two input points were really on either side of the middle. Not very surprising. So in fact, what you find is this holds if i and j have the same sign or one of them is zero. Okay? And otherwise, if they're both non-zero of opposite signs, then there's no triangle. So the product is zero. Okay, so when you see this, you probably shouldn't be thinking of Laurent polynomials anymore. I mean, calling them x and x inverse doesn't seem very smart if they multiply to zero. So instead, what you will do is you will call them you know, by two different names, and you need to have the relation that their product is zero. Okay, so that's the output of the calculation. Now, you get polynomials in two variables, x and y, whose product is zero. Well, now you go think a bit about algebraic geometry and you think, hey, I know a space whose functions look like that. Namely, the space given by x, y equals zero in C squared. Okay? And that is indeed a mirror to the pair of pants, but this does not quite prove it. Okay? So, you can similarly take a Lagrangian T to the wrapped complex of L0 with T to turn an object of a wrapped category of a pair of pants into a module over this ring. Let's call this ring R. Okay. Which is the same thing as a sheaf over this, but there's no well, there's no easy way at this level of calculation to understand why this functor should be an embedding, whether you lose information or not. Um, this Lagrangian L0 does not a priori know everything there is to know about this Fouquet category, does not generate it. Turns out it does, but in infinite time, which is not something we can test easily in Fleur theory. The, analog the analogy here is if you look at a sheaf on this singular curve, it is true that every coherent sheaf has a resolution by copies of a structure sheaf. But that resolution may not be finite. Okay, so if you have a smooth affine variety, every coherent sheaf can be expressed by, has a finite resolution by vector bundles, which are all trivial. On a singular variety, that's no longer true. And that's how you can see you know, some of the infiniteness. So not to be discouraged, all that means is you need to have a few more Lagrangians in here. So, so here, yes. I mean, the, the symplectic structure that you put on the pair of pants is simply leaving a disk. Uh, actually, no, and adding an infinite amount of area oh, in here. Sorry, Sorry. There's yes. A lack of symmetry yeah, yeah. The end, so. No. Uh, yeah, you want to treat them all sim you know, symmetrically. So yeah, you change the area form so that there's infinitely much area in there. It's not directly, it's, it's mostly relevant for technical reasons. <coughs> but yeah. And so, okay, what other Lagrangians should we try to understand? Well, an obvious answer might be, I want to understand 
this arc L1, which after all I can do easily because you know, by symmetry, as you said, it behaves in a similar way to L0. And there's a different one here that I can call L, L2. Actually, let me order them cyclically in the right way. So L1 and L2 would be these two things. And I can ask, you know, what do the calculations do? So the answer to that, whoops. Well, I mean, basically, well, anyway, you can calculate uh, things like, for example, just to give an example, so the floor complex of L1 with itself will also look very similar to that one. And I'm going to use a common variable x, but I don't want to give z the same name. There's a reason for that. If I go from L0 to L1, the wrap floor complex of L0 with L1, see, if I push, say, L0 at infinity, well, nothing happens in this end because L1 doesn't go there. But in this end, I get an infinite sequence of intersections. And this looks a lot like C bracket X, um, not as a ring. This one doesn't have a multiplicative structure, but as a bimodule over these two rings. Right? If I have a morphism from L0 to L1, I can pre or post compose with an endomorphism of L0 or of L1 as bimodule over these two. And there's a similar story with L2. And anyway, you can calculate this whole thing. And then you can ask, can I reproduce that on the mirror side? The answer is yes. I just need to remember that this has two pieces called A and B. And what I should do is calculate the X groups of, so there's two things I can do. One is the extensions of OA with itself. And the other one is the extensions of, say, O to OA. So what is O sub A? It's the structure sheaf of just this component, which means I take the trivial vector bundle over this thing, and I include it into, I mean, sheaves are willing to include in a way that vector bundles don't. Okay? So Homs from O to OA is the same thing as calculating the sheaf cohomology of OA, and it's the same thing in the end as functions on this component A. So you know, A is just the x-axis. There's a natural coordinate x. And it, you'll just get polynomials in that variable x. What's slightly harder is the x group of OA with itself. For that, you need to resolve OA. And that's, again, an exercise in algebraic geometry. What you find is that this looks like exactly that kind of thing, but where now there's a grading issue, but degree of z is 2. So z is a class in x2 of OA with itself that you can compute and find exists or ask an algebraic geometer. And powers of that class are there, but if you multiply it by any power of x, you'll get 0. And basically, you know, and similarly, L2 will correspond to the structure sheaf of B. And equipped with these, these guys now, you can actually do much more serious geometry because every sheaf here can be expressed in terms of o, OA and OB, or actually just two of the three are enough in finite time. And same thing for Lagrangian sphere. Okay. Now, Yes. See what, what corresponds to taking, uh, for example, just a, a sum of two coherent sheaves on, on, on. Ah, right. So I've been very sloppy about you know, derived equivalents and so on. So really, we should be talking about the derived Fouquet category, which means besides Lagrangians, we want to allow formal direct sums of Lagrangians. And we want to also allow formal extensions or mapping cones of Lagrangians. Um, and essentially, well, the short answer is a direct sum is just a disjoint union. So you treat, you know, a union of, form a union of several Lagrangians. Well, you see, if you do the intersection theory with a union of two Lagrangians, uh, you just get both sets of intersection points. And unless you try to do something fancy, they are not going to actually interact. If you want to make them interact, if you want an extension rather than a direct sum, 
then you need to explain what you will do at intersections between these Lagrangians. And there's a whole theory of Lagrangian surgery and how that relates to mapping cones and so on. So we often have geometric interpretations, but the short answer to derive categories is just, you know, let algebra take over. So yes? That's a very, very good question. Um, so indeed, there's an apparent lack of symmetry on that side. Um, and so it's, it's a very strange thing that this does not have a threefold symmetry. And there's not much of a threefold symmetry until you actually do calculations. And you see even then the symmetry is broken because this z, which here seems to play a completely symmetric role with the others, is a degree two extension class. So the answer is, as long as you insist on doing sheaf cohomology in a graded sense with a notion of, you know, a cohomology group knows in what degree it lives, you will not be able to see the threefold symmetry. If you're willing to let go of that, and maybe this is a good time to tell you, in fact, Fleur theory on a non calabria manifold only has a Z mod 2 grading. So I couldn't assign degrees to intersection points in a consistent way. Um, then I can actually restore the symmetry. And this is exactly what I was going to get to next, actually. So perfect occasion. Unfortunately, the answer is going to have slightly, it will be slightly impressionistic, given that this is a colloquium and I'm near the end of the time. Um, so maybe another motivation for why do we want a better answer, besides the, you know, the threefold symmetry is nice and important. But the other question would be, we'd also like to be able to compare the algebraic geometry of a pair of pants to the symplectic geometry of a mirror. And we do not have a theory of, say, Lagrangian Fleur theory or any kind of significant symplectic geometry on this kind of singular space. So this is not the kind of space we want to look at. We want a better space. Better, unfortunately, means more complicated. Um, but so there's another answer, which is more symmetrical to what is mirror to the pair of pants. The answer is the space C cubed equipped with a function, which is just the product of the coordinates. Actually, there's a minus sign for correctness, but you shouldn't care, with this function going to C. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, the zero level of this function is just the union of the coordinate hyperplanes in C cubed. It's pretty singular. The, what happens around uh, is all the other fibers look like C star squared. Okay. So it so happens that there's a way to do algebraic geometry on a space with a function. Um, well, there's many ways, there are many things you can do in there, but there's a flavor of, of uh, singularity theory which kind of replicates pretty closely what a derived category of coherent sheaves does. And this is sometimes called the derived category of singularities of this function. Let's call this function W. And another incarnation of it is sometimes called matrix factorizations of W. So matrix factorizations, well, Coherent sheaves first. Complexes of coherent sheaves, you can think of complexes of vector bundles. A complex is you have a bunch of maps of vector bundles whose composition is zero. Instead of asking that things compose to zero, you're going to ask that they compose to W times identity. In this sense, you get a factorization of W as a product of maps of sheaves. And they're called matrix factorizations because in general, these sheaves might be higher rank. And then what you really are looking at is matrices of polynomials whose products are W times identity. Okay, so there is a whole study of this category. The simplest thing I will do here is say, in this particular case, there's a theorem of Orloff, which says that this will be equivalent to the derived category of coherent sheaves of x, y equals zero, but in a way that breaks the symmetry. To produce this equivalence, you need to decide Okay, I will split z away from the others. And now you can compare this with the wrapped Fouquet category, and you have an equivalence as well. I mean, you can check it directly by calculating in this world, but I don't have time to tell you what that means exactly. Instead, the very last thing I wanted to tell you is there's also a statement of mirror symmetry on the other side.
which we can now make sense of and couldn't have done in the previous setup with just this curve x, y equals 0, which is that you can look at coherent sheaves on this pair of points. Okay? And you can compare that to there is a notion, of, there is a kind of Fouquet category associated to a space with a function on it. What that consists of is you allow non-compact Lagrangians, but um, in the base, well, what's the anyway, so this whole function W, W only can go towards plus infinity, not minus infinity. So what do I mean by that? I will just show by example. So the claim is there is a particular Lagrangian in this category, L, <coughs> such that the endomorphisms of L can be calculated and will match with the endomorphisms of a structure sheaf on this. Now I forgot to tell you what is this as an algebraic variety. My favorite pair of pants is defined by the equation x plus y plus 1 equals 0 inside c star squared. Why is that a pair of pants? Take c star squared. So take c squared, delete the coordinate axis. Take a line in there. Well, of course, you have to delete the two points where it intersects the coordinate axis. You're left with c minus two points is a pair of pants. Okay. Uh, and so now functions on that you can calculate because c star squared, the regular functions are Laurent polynomials in two variables, x and y. And restricting here, tells you that you should quotient by x plus y plus 1, the ideal generated by that. Okay. So what is this mysterious Lagrangian? Well, the best I can do is tell you that it lives. So you should imagine this projection of c cubed to c. Apart from this hideous fiber here that we don't know how to deal with, it, has, it mostly consists of c star squares. And in C star squared, there's a nice Lagrangian, which is just R plus squared. If you want, this is just you know two copies of a cylinder. And in each copy of a cylinder, take our favorite Lagrangian from before. And now do this. You know, so OK, this is a two-dimensional Lagrangian inside this complex two-dimensional fiber. And I claim I can get a Lagrangian in C cubed by, putting the, by considering these together over a U-shaped arc in here. You might ask, why the heck do I want to do that? Well, short answer. Uh, when I do the Fleur homology of the thing that's consisting of a copy of R plus squared over each of these fibers with itself, I need to perturb, of course. And the rule of perturbation in this category I did not quite define is that in the base, I will push things up a bit. Remember, I only go to plus infinity, never to minus infinity. And in the fiber, I will wrap a lot, like I always do. So what kinds of intersections does this have with itself? It has intersections here and intersections here. And here, I get a copy of a self-wrapped Fleur homology of this R plus squared. Remember, for R plus in C star, we got Laurent polynomials in one variable. You shouldn't be surprised that here we'll get Laurent polynomials in two variables. <coughs> Here, same story. We have two copies of R plus squared. We'll get Laurent polynomials in two variables. But now it's time for the Fleur differential to enter. There's, you see this disk over here. And now you're supposed to look for holomorphic sections with boundary conditions on these Lagrangians above this region. And you're supposed to count them in a suitable way. And you'll find that the connecting map is multiplication by 1 plus x plus y. So the cohomology of this is exactly what you wanted. And this is where I should stop because I'm out of time. Thank you. Yes? Is, it, is there a simple story if you instead took a sphere with more punctures instead of just... Three? Yes. So if you had a sphere with more punctures, uh, I think the, the simple answer would have been that you would take... Oh, I shouldn't try to make it. OK, let me not know. Uh, I, I mean, I think I know what this is. But anyway, a sphere with four punctures, one possible answer in this language 
is there's a space that's just a little bit more complicated than C cubed, which is the toric variety whose one skeleton looks like that. And more precisely, that's the total space of O of minus 1 plus O of minus 1 over CP1. OK? Take this space, and it has a function on it, which is a toric monomial that vanishes to order 1 on each facet. OK? And so that will define for you a function again. And in that sense, now you can look at matrix factorizations of this or at um, the Fouquet category, and they will match the four punctured sphere. So if I'm not mistaken, I think the analog in that picture would be now take instead a singular curve that has a CP1 and two complex lines passing through it, and you know the nodal union of that. But I, oh yes, 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 that's got to be it. Okay, so the other answer is take C, take CP1, and take C and make this nodal. But on that, of course, you can only do algebraic geometry, no symplectic geometry. And same thing with more, more functions. You just make longer chains of P1s. So this is now connected to Calabi-Yau's paper? Well, this is, a tori this is a toric Calabi-Yau. Um, but, OK, so if you just take this Calabi-Yau by itself, its mirror is something slightly different. So there's an interpretation, anyway, that so if you start with a pair of pants, what this three-dimensional thing is, the reason why this mirror is higher dimensional, one thing you could say is, well, the critical locus is one-dimensional anyway, and that's what we care about. We really Secretly, we probe the critical locus. But if you think about it as a total space, it's mirror to a total space here that's secretly, it's basically a conic bundle over the ambient space, in this case, C star squared, where the, the conics become singular over the pair of pants. So there's a replacement space, which is actually a complex dimension three, that is more directly geometrically mirror to this three-dimensional complex replacement space. And that's, in general, um, a general slogan. When you try to extend mirror symmetry to more and more complicated things, the mirrors you get usually end up being higher dimension, but with functions whose critical locus are of the dimension you want. And the reason for that is secretly you're taking mirror symmetry for larger replacement spaces and then modifying things so that you can dimensionally reduce. Um, Anyway, so now this Calabiao threefold has a relation to a different Calabiao threefold, which is basically the conic bundle over C star squared with equation xy equals 1 plus u plus v plus some constant times uv, which is also known as, well, it's closely related to the cotangent bundle of S3. This is, in fact, the Milner fiber of, uh, well, you know, the smoothing of an ordinary double point, and this is its small resolution. Uh, but one needs to modify this in various ways, and you can go back down to mirror symmetry between this curve, which is a four-punctured P1, and this space with a function. I should have said, sorry, but this is like joint work with Abu Zaid and Katsarkov. And various parts were with other people, but anyway. Sorry to all my collaborators that I... Yes. So we don't know yet how to build. Okay. So in general, the best intrinsic ex construction we, get, we hope to have is that given your favorite space, there is a larger space equipped with a function whose critical locus looks like the space you started with. Simplest case, you had a smooth manifold you turn it into a Morse bot stratum of singularities uh, for some function on a larger space. And now the geometry of that larger space with that function is equivalent to what you started with. Now, once that space is of a suitable kind, it will have what's uh, a Lagrangian torus vibration that you can dualize in the sense of the strominger yauza law conjecture providing a geometric mirror space of the same dimension. And then that will also come equipped with a function by thinking carefully about uh, various features of the geometry. And that might sometimes, again, reduce down to something lower dimensional, or you might be stuck with a high dimensional space with a function and you study its singularity theory. Um, so that's in some sense the, the setting. Now, in practice, to carry out this algorithm, I need to start in general with a presentation of my favorite space as a particular kind of, say, hypersurface or complete intersection in some ambient space. And the mirror I get will depend very heavily on how I chose to present it. 
So for example, I can show you mirrors to the point or the elliptic curve as, well, a point by itself or a point in CP1 or a point in something else all look very different. And of course, they still have the same geometry at the end. Um, but all these spaces are equivalent to each other essentially in the sense that critical point, you know, the same critical loci of different functions on different spaces. If there are no more questions, let's thank 